Welcome to Testimony Mountain. It's such a joy to be here with Veronica Swift. And if you are not familiar with her, really encourage you to check out her blog. Do you want to share a little bit, Veronica, where people can connect with you? Sure. Good morning, Adina. It's lovely to see you again and speak with you. Uh, I've been looking forward to this. Um, so I write a blog and I publish it at veronicaswift.blog online. And right now I've got 350 posts over the past three years that I've written that deal with a wide variety of issues, most of them connected to the occult. Um, they range from Freemasonry to church infiltration to uh, practices of these people. Um, to the people who are actually involved that we see every day in newspapers or in magazines, to the people who have come out and are talking about it. So I draw on 50, 60, 70 whistleblowers that have come out of these practices and I try to compile their revelations into bite-sized pieces that people like, like me can kind of, sort of, begin to wrap our head around because it's really not an easy thing to understand. Something that's been highly hidden from us, that's what the word occult means, is hidden. So learning about all these things has been quite an adventure. So I, I, I made a deal with God when I first started this. I'm like, well, I'll do it, but somebody else has got to be, you got to at least send me one person who's got to be interested in this because I'll write these things if, if one person reads them then I'll be satisfied. It won't just be an exercise for me, myself, and I, right? Um, and he did. <laughs> and <so> sure did. <laughs> he sent me a few people, and uh, and and a lot of them have, have communicated with me that they find it valuable. So, so that's why I do it, and that's where you can find me. And it is because of the subject matter and because of the um, harassment that I received for having put these this information out compiled it and put it out into the public it is unfortunately behind a paywall however it's not terribly expensive so if you subscribe you'll have access to all 350 of those posts plus about a thousand references which include transcripts from just about everything that i've drawn from so if you need to find where i got it from you can so that's where I am at mostly. I'm also at veronicaswift.locals.com. If you want to come and ask me other questions, that's where you can find me. So I so appreciate you, Veronica, because of, you know, you're not a survivor. This wasn't your background. Uh, and so you are really an advocate for survivors. And I so appreciate that role that you play. And your skill in just being able to put things in, like you said, bite-sized pieces for people to understand. And so just encouragement, if you have people who struggle with uh, this kind of topic, is Veronica is a great resource for um, gently <laughs> getting that out to them in ways that they can understand, hopefully. Yeah. And that's kind of where we wanted to jump in today in just that... Uh, you know, it is hard to get this information out there. And we were talking about, is the church ready? Because the yeah. challenge is that uh, the church has been heavily infiltrated. I believe every denomination has been infiltrated. Yes. And so every Christian should know and understand some of these principles. Yeah, uh, I, I, I agree. And it's really sad to me. Every time I turn around, especially lately, I see another bit of information that says, okay, this denomination, this is how they started out, or this is what has happened with them. And I, I have yet, I think, to find pretty much any mainstream pr Protestant church denomination in the U.S. that hasn't been affected by the occult, which is a hard thing to say, yeah. because I grew up in a mainstream Protestant church, and I have had to reformulate some of my ideas about what they're doing and why they're there and what the purpose is. And, and unfortunately, I've even taken to calling my former church sort of, you know, potluck Christianity because that's kind of what it's become. It's not deeply spiritually connected. It's not deeply connected to Jesus. It's not deeply connected to the word. It's not deeply connected to biblical principles even. Mm -hmm. um, it is and has been deeply undercut by the social justice kind of wokeism apparatus. 
um, as I think many have. Even the ones that don't think they have been. I, I took to going for a while to a conser conservative Lutheran church with a family member. And even there, I had to listen to why we have to be uh, good neighbors and listen carefully to all of these crazy ideas from <laughs> the political realm that are so anti-Christian uh, that it's not even funny. Um, yeah, it's 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 sad. And, and unfortunately, what's even more sad is that this is not a, just a new thing. It's not just the new modern day ideas that have dug in and really taken over. It's also very old. Like I also <laughs> read recently about how um, the, the Congregationalist churches in certain states, you know, in the late 1700s, when, when just pre-becoming a nation, you know, the 1770s kind of idea, that they were state-sponsored churches and they were heavily infiltrated by the Collins family, which if you know anything about the occult, you'll know that the Collins family is one of the high, high level bloodline surnames. Um, they are the big witches and warlocks, big, ba big bad evil witches and warlocks. Yeah. Um, and they they had a part in the Congregationalist Church formation and in their spinoff to, I believe, Unitarianism and a couple other denominations. And they were big at undercutting and undermining. And that's not the only one. You think back to the, Latter the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, otherwise known as Mormons. You're back to an individual whose family, Joseph Smith's family was in the occult, heavily in the occult. They, they were... Uh, their family, one of their family businesses was um, archaeology. They, they went around looking for religious artifacts mm -hmm. and digging them up. And he was big into scrying and he was being into this term called sealing, which I've had some um, arguments, recent arguments with people behind the scenes. Sealing is a very occult, it's a very witchcraft practice. And the LDS church has a lot of sealing rituals that go along with it. And these have been revealed and, and brought out by individuals like um, Gerald Sandra Tanner. They wrote the couple of different books on the LDS church and witchcraft. And there are even younger kids who have come out of the LDS tradition who are on YouTube now talking about these things yeah. in the open, which is very, very frowned upon. Uh, the LDS church is very insular and they don't they don't usually let these kinds of rituals and things from the inner, inner sanctum Mm -hmm. out into the wild but a lot of that information has been coming out so yeah, yeah. there's there isn't and i'm not picking on these particular individual denominations you could talk about almost any of them catholicism for example i was just listening to a video by bill shevelin yesterday and this morning and he said that in his practice of becoming uh, a, a higher level I don't know if he called it warlock or witch or what exactly he called it, but in the leveling up in his occult tradition, because he was an occultist before he um, turned to, to Christ, mm -hmm. he said he had to actually become an old time Catholic priest wow. within the occult tradition mm -hmm. to then be able to do the, the rituals that were evil. <laughs> I mean, it sounds odd. It doesn't, it sound like, it sounds mind blowing. It sounds like this can't actually be true. Then you look at Jesse Zaboder's reveals about the priests of the Catholic Church and the bishops and the archbishops and some of the higher or even higher level people. You look at the Vatican that's full of people who are in the Brotherhood. So it, it crosses all what you would call quote unquote Christian yeah. traditions and it's so incredibly sad. It is. And for me, it is personal. Um, you know, my journey is still unfolding, but. Um, you know, it's probably a year and a half ago that the Lord did show me that that's was their target for me, that I would be, you know, not a big major Christian leader, but a, a mid-level Christian leader who would in some way, you know, destroy or bring yeah. down the church. And so, you know, that was quite shocking uh, when the Lord revealed that to me um, and you know, has been part of my journey of going, well, I'm going to do just the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> expose all of this stuff. <laughs> and, uh, yep. The enemy is not going to win on this one. And so yeah. that's my determination. They're, they're, you're not alone either. I mean, they have sent so many people, some of which have just 
destroyed me, my heart, because they were um, individuals that I listened to when I was a kid or even older. I think to the to the Billy Grahams, and people yeah. are still stunned that Billy Graham was a high level Mason and a high level occultist and a, a child abuser, ped pedophile, you name it. We don't know everything that he did. His son Franklin Graham has been named as well. Yeah. Um, who's the guy who was at the Crystal Cathedral? Uh, Robert Schuller. Yes. And his family. So we're not just talking about the the pastors. We've heard names like Joel Osteen. We've yeah. heard other people say other names. So lots of these big mega churches are definitely not headed up by individuals who have been trained by reputable um institutions they've been trained by the brotherhood to to come in and take over and they get pushed up to the top levels and supported and and they may say some good things but then you got to wonder what percentage of yeah. the things they do say are specifically designed to either take down the church or deceive the people into thinking that what they're doing or saying is christianity when in fact it might not be. So is it 80%? Is it 90%? Are we getting 10, 20, 30%? What's the, you know, this is the big question that's on everybody's mind is what percentage of the people, not just in the churches, but in general, what percentage of the white hat, what percentage of the alt media, what percentage of, uh, what are we getting? Because people are starting to wake up to the fact that we are being fed a line and it's coming from a lot of different directions. Yeah. But that must have made you feel horrible. Yeah, it's it's been a challenge um, to face some of the memories that the Lord has surfaced um, in that. And and I would say, you know, I was raised in the Seventh Day Adventist Church, which, you know, in some ways you would think pristine and all of that. And some of those things would not be a cult or connected governmentally and different things. But that's part of the way they hide things. Yeah. And then, you know, we left that went into the vineyard movement and into some other charismatic movements and and so on. Um, and it, it's interesting because even the um, the group that we were just uh, sort of still part of, but I, I feel like I'm a missionary to them. Um, when I asked the Lord how many of the general people uh, had a background in mind control, and I felt like he said 50 to 70%. Yeah. Um, I was at another more mainline charismatic church and I asked the Lord the question there and he, I felt like he said 30%. Um, and wow. so, you know, it, it is in every church, both leadership and in the congregation. Yeah. Um, and, you know, not to be freaked out over these things, but that we know who wins in the end and we, yeah. we can be either part of the problem or we can be part of the solution. Exactly. Exactly. And we can't be part of the solution if we have no idea what's going on. Yeah. And most of us, I'll be frank, most of us not only do not know what's going on, but have a, a real big resistance to being led to the, the real information, the truth information that's going on. And I say that because I was one of them. You know, I did not come to this position. This is not an easy place to be. I'll say that. Um, it's not easy information to have to digest. And it is certainly not easy information to have to incorporate into your, you know, I don't, you know, your being in a sense, because it takes all of you to really grasp it and grok it and come to, you know, to terms that the life you've lived and the things you've learned and uh, the things you've learned. I mean, the amount of time they spend forcing us to learn crap that is, you know, is to our detriment just irritates the bejeepers out of me. It really does. It makes me so mad. I spent time on that? Really? you got to be kidding me. Because then you have to, not only did you have to spend the time learning it, but you have to spend the time unlearning it and relearning something else. Yeah, they waste our time. They waste a lot of our time. So yeah, yeah that's one of the things that I hope to do with the blog is to take that amount of time. You know, I've got the time, but a lot of people don't. So you can consult. <laughs> You can consolidate, if I can consolidate that, then other people can learn a little bit quicker. And for the amount of pushback I'm getting, uh, I think it's valuable, even if it is behind a paywall. Yes. Um, so there is that you can kind of Definitely. gauge, you can kind of gauge by who, who's getting beaten up <laughs> by the enemy as to perhaps a little bit of what the truth is. That's yeah. not always true. That's not a, a fail safe, but it, it is a little bit of a clue. 
Yeah. It's, it's a, a bigger thing than we understand and imagine and not to be freaked out over it again, because our safety, our protection is in the true Lord Jesus. And we have to stay firmly there. But I, you know, I've, I've been pondering this in, um, some of you may know, some of you may not, uh, Mike Bickle and the controversy with the International House of Prayer in Kansas City. And I was intimately involved in that, in that uh, for six years, I was an intercessory missionary in our local house of prayer uh, in California. And so it was very much steeped in what was coming out of that. And so the recent um, sexual allegations and so on, uh, the prophetic manipulation uh, has been horrendous and, you know, begins to make you question a, a lot of other things. And I do believe there is a true, but a lot of what is, is out there is twisted. And so in all of the blogs and, you know, journalist stuff out there, what I'm not hearing is any conversation about um, it being part of mind control. And, um, and I don't know for sure, you know, I, I think when you've kind of been in the system, you see these little breadcrumbs and you go, you know, I don't have solid evidence yet, but there's enough pieces to begin to kind of go, huh, I think that there is something there. And so I was just reading a uh, article yesterday um, that talked about in Freemasonry that um, sodomy is considered, is called the key of David. And that is a phrase um, that Mike Bickle used quite a bit, talking about the key of David and that he was kind of a David and all of that. And even with these allegations, you know, people go, well, yeah, he's David. Well, David messed up too. Well, you know, so he can, he can be forgiven and restored. And yes, he is forgiven. Um, but when there is, you know, someone who is a known pedophile, they should not be, I don't believe in ministry um, and probably never um, restored back to that. Yeah. And so it's, it's hard stuff because it destroys people's faith. Um, you know, the house of prayer movement was so many young people. Yeah. And so it's really rocked worldwide, that segment of population. So a couple, three, four, five things come to mind. Um, one is an article I did recently on the Duggar family and um, their involvement in, uh, in in the group that, you know, their, the whole family is involved in this, this group that, that reminded me, quite frankly, of light side of the system. Um, very rigid, very rule oriented, very, um, very strict, very uh, controlled. And so if you see something like that, then you're, you're, you can definitely say that's a clue to, to move towards, to look, um, to look at possible occult involvement, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thing, that kind of rigidity and shame based treatment and fear based biblical teaching, mm -hmm. uh, is not of, Jesus Christ, and it's not of God. So if you've got that in a church, then you're looking at what I would interpret as an infiltrated church at what level or what area, you know, it's hard to, to pinpoint, but I'd say that's one, that's one key. The other key is, is anytime you're looking at leaders, leadership in a church that has been accused of child sexual activity with a child, uh, that's a it should be an immediate and alarming red flag. And we've been uh, desensitized to that because of so much of that happening in the Catholic Church and so much of it never being um, correctly processed through the courts, the the, pre the priests never being properly um, jailed for yeah. what they've done. Uh, and, and the kids, you know, never healed because um, of the way the the whole structure of the Catholic Church is meant to to hide that. So, mm -hmm. so I think we need to undo a little bit of our, I don't want to say jadedness, that's not the right word, but some of the desensitization that has occurred yeah. to this. If you see that, if it happens in the church or in you're talking, this is a big, 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 bad, bad sign because yeah. any church leader, no, you shouldn't find any reputable church leader um, whoever gets accused of something sexually oriented with a kid or a teenager. 
or yeah. whoever. Um, so th that's that's a couple. Those are a couple thoughts. Well, and with with Mike Nickel, it was a fourteen year old, a fifteen year old, and a nineteen year old. Um, you know, and it was interesting. I was just listening to a um, podcast by Rick Joyner, who also, you know, is a big name out there yeah. in yeah. the charismatic movement, who is also, you know, um, publicly uh, what Knights of Malta or whatever. So that right. that's a huge red flag there. Yeah. Uh, but he was basically saying that he he thinks he believes that all this the allegations are will eventually turn out to be a, a nothing burger is what he called it and was just and he was making it sound like the accusations were a worse sin than what Mike Bickle did and it, it's such twisting of all of this stuff and yeah. and I you know I that's classic brotherhood the, yeah. the the blowing it off is classic brotherhood they're going to say what they need to say to put people off the the trail so that nothing happens and mentally so that we're all duped into believing that you know a 40 50 year old 60 year old man having any kind of accusation or relations with a teenager is somehow okay that's that is definitely what they want us to believe. I mean, just look at what has, is happening in the mainstream. They are trying to make sexual involvement of adults with infants. Nor they're trying to normalize that. Yeah. They're trying to normalize it because it's part of what they do. And so they want the rest of us to stop being offended by it and stop, you know, having the urge to, to whack them over the head about it. Um, which, you know, if this was the 1800s, those those individuals could not say those things out loud. You couldn't you wouldn't be able to say it out loud. They'd be lynched. They'd, yes. they'd be set upon by a mob and they would be no longer. So that tells you the the amount of uh, progress that the Brotherhood has made with the general population's idea of what is OK and what is not OK and what you can do about it and what what you can't. Since they have all of the all of the people who, quote unquote, should be helping. They've got the police, they've got the CPS, they've got the sheriff's departments now that used to be um, pretty independent, but there are, lots of those are captured as well. They have the judicial system, they have the NGOs that liaise with uh, all of this stuff. They, they are in control of all of it, yeah. from what I can tell. So there's nobody even to go to to get help. You're going to be redirected wherever they want to redirect you and or case thrown out, never heard, plea bargained, somebody pays someone off, people just aren't getting, um, they aren't getting what they, they, they're due. But I'd say that anybody who, well, first of all, Knights of Malta, so that, that would be pretty indicative, it'd be like a 98 to 100% chance that their brotherhood, first of yeah. all, so, and, and, and second of all, I think any, any individual who um, blows off yeah, or tries to make someone believe that that adults interacting in that way with a teenager, even a 19 year old, is acceptable, really in this day and age is not. So yeah. that's that's that I don't even know how you change people's mind about that. Now that's a big question I have is now that we have shifted the mindset, mm -hmm. how far are they gonna be able to push it before people push back? Or have we gone so far that we're never gonna be able to? pushback. I know there are sane people in the world and I know there are people like you and I, because I talk to them, who think that this stuff is not okay. I think yeah. it's just a lot of us really don't know what to do about it per se, um, because it feels like a, a an out of control train, a bus running down a hill with no brakes. What do you do at that point? How do you make these changes? I'm not sure I, I know enough about social engineering to have any answers for that, but somebody out there needs to come up with some answers. Yeah, well, I know God has the answers. I think one of the, the challenging mindsets to break through is um, understanding how, you know, the brotherhood works in the light and dark side of the system, as well as you have to have equal amount of good to outweigh evil that you do. Right. And so, you know, it's even like with Rick Joyner, I I really enjoyed a lot of his books early on before I knew all of this. Yeah. You know, yeah. it was good stuff and it it impacted my life. Right. Um, you know, and so like with Mike Bickle and others, you know, people look at him and go like, well, he spends hours a day in prayer and worship. And, yep. you know, he's so godly. How, yeah. you know, and so, so does every so does every other witch in the occult. 
They yeah. all, somebody said, somebody asked me that the other day. It's a fair point. You know, they, they said, um, but you know, which is in warlocks, they can't pray to God. I said, oh yeah, they can. Not only can they, they do. Not only do they, they use scripture all the time and they use it in a way that, that is beneficial for them. They use it right before they go into a ritual. They use it right before they ritually murder someone. They, they use it in a way and, and to a depth that is hard for most of us to imagine, but no, they're not immune to it at all. If you listen on, I've been listening to, um, an ex occultist on uh, Aquarius Rising Africa, Caleb Jade, and his just his latest episode. Uh, they're they're reading out of a a book. I I can't. I think it's called the Arbital of Magic, and it's it it speaks of Jesus Christ. It speaks of the Scripture. It talks about Ecclesiastes. It it mentions this, and 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 he says, yeah, because they use the Bible. They use the Bible and they talk about it. So that's one way they fool us into thinking that they're on the same side as we are or fool us into thinking that they're Christians, but they're not. Yeah. And I think the, the mentality in Christianity tends to be you're either all good or you're all bad. Yeah. And so that's the easy way to judge and classify instead of understanding you know, all of us have a mixture, but that's particularly how the cult works is to put on this beautiful front of perfection and devotion and good words, all of that, but behind the scene to be doing evil. Now, right. the other complicating part of that is um, whether they're co-conscious or not. Right. Because I wasn't co-conscious yeah. and, you know, I feel like my relationship with the Lord has been, you know, growing and has always been there. But at the same time, it was shut off from another part of me that wasn't so good yeah. that I'm only now just discovering. And and that, you know, there are times when it's like, I'd like to go back to the good old days when, yeah. you know, yeah. I could just be good. But yeah. um, I, I want the truth. And um, that's what I'm pursuing. So just for people who don't understand co-consciousness that's a term that's used to describe someone who's been through such incredible horrific experiences so much trauma that they have to to be able to survive have had to compartmentalize and wall off experiences so that they don't have to remember or feel them in their everyday walking about eating, sleeping, drinking life. Because as a child, when you experience extraordinary trauma, uh, you really can't handle it, especially sexual trauma. There, no, no child is prepared emotionally, mentally, physically, or neurologically, I'd say, for sexuality. That is an adult experience that ch children's bodies can't really deal with very well. And so a lot of it's, it, it doesn't even matter. You don't have to have been in the, the occult. You don't have to have been mind controlled. You don't have to have been programmed. You can just have had a horrific sexual experience as a kid to have taken that experience and walled it off. And then you don't remember it. Yeah. And usually because of brain changes somewhere after the age of 30, um, these walls that surround that particular memory start to break down. It's a physiological thing that seems to happen. It's why in the Brotherhood, a lot of people who had a lot of trauma uh, and who are slaves or sex slaves, they they get terminated at the age of 30, 32, 33, somewhere in there because their programming and their they start to break down as human beings and they start to experience all of these horrific memories that they haven't had to deal with on a daily basis and it can be awful so when you're dealing with that kind of stuff coming back into your life it can be difficult and then once you get through and you process some of the memories sometimes you can talk those part there's little holes there's 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 windows through from one side to the other so that's what co-consciousness is when you can have these walled off pieces of yourself that you can peek in and see at, and they can kind of talk to you and you can kind of talk to them. So there's a little bit of information sharing, um, but even it's 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 still such a painful thing that you don't have to deal with it full force 100% of the time. It's a safety, it's a safety thing. So, and a lot of people don't have co-consciousness until really later on mm -hmm. when you've really dealt with a lot of the memories. But that means that like you, you're dealing with a lot of these memories coming up. 
Yeah, which, you know, I'm grateful the Lord didn't permit the memories to come through. There was there was breadcrumbs, right. you know, looking back in my life, but didn't until I turned 50. And um, I'm grateful <clears throat> because of where I'm at spiritually and understanding who God is that it's been easier to handle it. Yeah. Um, I think if if the memories had surfaced early when I begged God to show me what is it, right. you know, I can right. handle it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I don't think I would have been able to to walk this journey out. And so uh, I'm grateful for his mercy. Yeah. But I think it gives us compassion because every perpetrator abuser was originally a victim. And yes. it doesn't excuse the horrendous stuff that they've done. Um, but because, you know, there's memories of me being a perpetrator too. Right. Um, you know, I have compassion for, you know, these Christian leaders who are being exposed in this season and exposure is necessary but I think when we can understand better what's going on um, and understand some of these things behind it and have the compassion of Jesus, we can handle it um, yeah. better than the polarization, which is what the brotherhood wants, you know, where right. they want people championing the victims and people championing the perpetrators. Right. But being able to go, hey, um, all of these are God's children. Yeah. And we've got to, in the light of God's love, face all of it. And bring it into the light. And justice his, is, yeah. yeah. Justice is a really hard word in this situation. Justice is almost something that can't be applied uh, here in the real world, in a sense, because uh, of the familial and um, handed down from parent to child uh, reality of what the brotherhood does. This is a, it's it's a way of being in certain families. Mm -hmm and the children have it done to them and they grow up and then they submit their own children yeah. to the same thing and it goes on generation after generation after generation which is hard to imagine especially if you've grown up in a good family but yeah. if you've grown up in one of these families and your friends your that family is friends with you know a lot of the other families who are doing the same thing it feels very normal yeah it feels very regular and you don't see you know, outside of that, you can't peer into an, a quote unquote normal family and say, hey, there's something wrong with what's going on in my life. <laughs> Meanwhile, as a child, you know, you've been through such horrific, horrific stuff that you can't really remember it all. You have a general memory that things aren't great. You have a general idea at times that something's not right, perhaps, but there's nothing concrete to go on. So it it's a beautiful system in the sense that it's a lot the way that it's constructed it allows it to continue, which is why they have such a stranglehold on silence. There's this key of silence. There is a code of silence. It's enforced. It's, it's, you know, it's drilled in and, and ground in to, to children who, who grow through, go through it. And so they don't talk for a lot of, a lot of the time, which, yeah. so people like myself, we have to talk for them. <laughs> I think, you know, because otherwise, what? without hard. exposure, without exposure, none of this comes out. With exposure, they haven't got a leg to stand on, and they yeah. know it. And that's one of the things, like with um, the Mike Bickle situation, is, you know, if he had come out in the beginning and been heartfelt, repentant, I think that, you know, there could have been um, not restoration to ministry, but restoration. And there wouldn't have been all of this, but when you see his buddies, you know, coming around him and standing and the silence, you know, but I understand because of being in the system that need to, I've got to keep that front. Um, yeah. You know, I think I've shared it before. I used to cheat in school um, and I justified it because I was going to get an A anyway, mm. but I would be devastated by a 96% or a 98%, you know, and so if oh, I could cheat, yeah. I would, you know, right. so it's this so strongly built into you. I've got to keep this image in this front and this perfection and yeah. all of those kinds of things. Um, when, you know, the true reality, which is so beautiful is that when we just bring everything into the light of Jesus's love, that's yeah. where healing takes place. Right. Yeah, it does really. Healing is possible. And, and I, I think it's a far, it's a distant 
thought for so many people who think I am so far away from being able to access that. I can't even contemplate it. I can't think about it, but it's there. It is there. Mm -hmm. And even if you can't accept it as being real, you can still pretend that it might be and move towards it. Yeah. So no, it's a fake it till you make it kind of attitude. You don't necessarily, not everything we believe is true. I hate the word belief in a sense because it's, it's based on our experiences for the most part. And so it's hard to believe things that we haven't experienced. So if you haven't experienced the love of Christ, it's hard to believe that it's there. It's hard to believe that it exists. It's hard to believe that you can have it. So don't believe it. Don't yeah. believe, just pretend. Pretend yeah. it's true and move towards it. And eventually you'll probably find out that it is. Yeah. And then you don't have to pretend anymore. <laughs> Uh, and it is it is hard. And, you know, even I, I'm grateful that enough of me has been solidified um, and enough understand the love of God that I'm able to walk this out. Right. Um, but, you know, even recently I had some memory surface and those parts of me were like, this is unforgivable. Nobody can forgive me. I'm not going to forgive myself. Yeah. You know, those types of things. Um, and, you know, I'm just grateful for the grace of the true Jesus to, yeah. to be able to come and, you know, just minister to those places for yeah. healing. And so it is possible. It, there's a, um, a gravity that children feel uh, when anything goes wrong, whether they're responsible for it or not. But if they are, if they do happen to be not responsible in the sense that, that they thought it up, I'm not yeah. talking about kids who are psych psychopaths. I'm talking about kids who have been shoved into a position they can't get out of like you yeah. were. You were in a position you couldn't escape. Yeah. You didn't have the power. You didn't have the strength. You didn't have the know-how. And then having to do things that are so far out of alignment with where your heart and your soul and your spirit are, that can feel unfor unforgivable. It can. It can feel unforgivable. Yeah. But it's not which is yeah. a nice thing. And as an adult, having an adult mind, yeah. um, it can take some time to convince those child states yes. that what they're feeling isn't true and isn't reality. Yeah. Um, but it is possible, thank goodness. Definitely. And I think the other part of this conversation in, in um, talking about, you know, the church and, and this whole mind control um, and walking it out is um, understanding the programming about false Jesuses. And mm. that is significant as well. Um, and I've had to deal because of their role, <laughs> you know, that they programmed me for, yeah. you know, I've had to deal with a whole range of false Jesuses from, um, you know, what came up as Jesuit Jesuses, which were, right. you know, robed figures that were beating me with a whip, you know, and it, that was that image of Jesus for those parts. But also more recently finding one that was, um, the, the name that came was Agreeable Jesus and Compromising Jesus. Oh, wow. And so, oh. you know, but I could feel the shift from who true Jesus is to this other thing. And so, you know, there's people out there that have uh, gone through this and they're sincerely believing that they're following Jesus, but it's probably a false, one of these compromising Jesuses. And so yeah. they get into this thing and, it, and it's hard to say to someone, you know, who's saying, but Jesus said to me, or I, yeah. you know, I felt this is what Jesus said to be able to go, well, I don't. I don't know that that's the true Jesus. Right. Yeah. That, so that goes back to testing the spirits. You can test Jesus just like you test anybody else in the, any other angel or demon or whatever you might be encountering. You can test them. You can say, are you the true Jesus, the one and only son of the God of all creation? Mm -hmm. And from my understanding anyway, they have to answer. Yes. And it, they cannot answer incorrectly or untruth. So if you get a waffling answer, shift that Jesus straight out of your life. <laughs> Boom him to the curb, man. Out and gone. Um, uh, yeah, because the 
the the angelic that are subservient mm -hmm. to our God yeah. um, have to say so. They have yeah. to say so. And so you you should and you can test those spirits all the time. Do it every time. It, anytime, anytime you get a visitation from anybody who you don't know, test yeah. them. And the, the challenging part of that, too, is we're not wanting to engender fear about this conversation because the true no. and real Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. Right. And so that is our inheritance. Our birthright is to be able to hear. And there's multitude of things that shut that down. Trauma is one thing that shuts that down. Fear yes. shuts that down. Lots of yeah. other things. Um, Depression. But, yeah. The other part of this is it's not just other spirits claiming to be Jesus, but in the programming is they actually program internal parts to be an internal Jesus. Right. And so then it's, it is, you know, a different way to, to work with them to go, actually, you're not Jesus, right. you know, and you were programmed that way, but that is not who you really are. Yeah. And um, that's a whole, that's a whole other level of, of difficulty. Yeah. 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 And so a lot of these things can seem so challenging and overwhelming. And I just encourage people when it begins to feel overwhelming, like this is too complicated. I'm just going to throw it out is that place of just simple relationship with the true Lord Jesus. That is what it all boils down to. And there's a simplicity in that. And I believe that is the narrow way. Uh, one of the ways, one of the ways you can get out of your mind, and by that I mean get out of your thoughts, mm -hmm. um, is to engage the other half of your brain. So one yeah. half of our brain operates in logic and reality and thoughts and words, and the other half of our brain operates in other stuff like art and music and singing. So if you find you're getting overwhelmed by, and this could probably truthfully be an entire program unto itself, talking about techniques and strategies to, to work with um, the difficult times in your life. But just to say it quickly here, one way to get out of that thought process is to draw. And it's to draw sometimes with your non-dominant hand or both hands at the same time. And it doesn't matter if you're a good artist or not. It doesn't matter what you draw or if you can even figure out what it is at the end. It makes absolutely no difference. But it gets you out of your thought, thought stream in your brain. And it literally forces you to change your mind. And it literally then forces your nervous system and your body to shift. Yeah. Um, and a lot of some of what the, I understand that the Brotherhood has done is has has made it impossible for people to talk about what has happened to them. And if you're in that state as well, drawing can also shift you out. They have not, to my knowledge, and I forget who exactly said this. It's not my idea. I I read it recently, but to my knowledge, they have not been able to to program you out of being able to draw. Yes. So it's it's one way to get yourself through that so if you can't bring because i i fully appreciate mentally bringing yourself back to jesus but there have been times and i haven't i haven't been able to do that yeah. and there are times that other people can't do that so if you can go that direction for sure and if you can't do something different whatever works whatever works yeah. use that technique that is so good and that's what i'm really pressing into even on my my healing journey um is the, the creative expression, um, even though it's hard and sometimes I resist it. Um, but, you know, dance, movement, um, drawing, journaling, singing, playing an yes. instrument, um, because part of what they do is they split the right and left part yes. of the brain. And that's part of what we mentioned earlier about the sodomy, the key of David, is that in that yeah. process, there's that splitting. And um, so I'm, I'm learning how to con make those connections back. Um, right. And it is through those creative expressions. And I think probably that's how I have even survived and been able to come out of that is singing and worshiping was always a really yeah. part of my journey. Yeah. And I think that that's kept me sane. Uh, there, were, there are many, many years that that was the only way I could connect with God. Yeah. That was it. So it's, yeah, it's, 
it's it's not uncommon it's very common and you got to do what you can do where you're at at the moment yeah so it it is a journey and again just the encouragement to people not to get overwhelmed by it um, when you start to feel that come again to that the simplicity of who Jesus is, because that is our safety, I believe. Yep. I think so. I see a lot of, it used to surprise me when I first um, started writing uh, about this subject. It astonished me that it seemed like almost everybody that came out uh, and turned to Christianity mm -hmm. because it didn't make sense to me at that time, not knowing, you know, than what I know now. It didn't make sense why everybody seemed to beeline in one direction. Mm -hmm. um, and there are, of course, a number of different people who have not. There are some that have gone to Islam, but if you look into their background, they have significant church and uh, Christianity abuses in their family or in their background. So in those cases, it really makes sense. But one of the things that I wish I had known, but have, have come to kind of coalesce in my, my mind recently, and I actually talked about this a couple of weeks ago, on a different podcast, but that won't be public. They, they're they not going to put that out publicly. So I'll say it again here, which is I've come to, <laughs> I've come to understand that the earth, the earth world that we live in, the three dimensional world that we live in has two reigning kingdoms. One is the kingdom of God and one is the kingdom of Satan or Lucifer, or Lucifer whichever you prefer to call, call him. And, and both are, I, want, I don't want to say fighting, but they are competing in a sense for our attention. Mm -hmm. And they're competing for um, pieces of us, probably pieces of us that I sure don't understand at this point. Yeah. One competes for pieces of our soul or our whole soul, and the other uh, would like us not to have to endure that hell. Yes. Um, so it, I think of it like two umbrellas, right? So you've got the umbrella that pro that is protective Mm -hmm. uh, and you can stand underneath that umbrella and be protected and be enveloped and encompassed in the kingdom of God. Or you can be pulled underneath, because I don't think anybody really willingly goes to the kingdom of Lucifer. I think it's a massive deception. It's a pulling. It's a trick. It's like that, you know, the, the curved end of the cane and somebody reaches out and just grabs you and yanks you across, the, you know, underneath as far as they can get. Um, and so you're either underneath the umbrella of the kingdom of God and his protections, or you're underneath the umbrella of the kingdom of Satan, in which case that umbrella is kind of like a filter. The deeper you go, the more it filters out the light of God from being able to penetrate and get towards you. So we were talking about this in the, in the, in the, um, under the auspices of why would a book like book series like Harry Potter be written? And, and the whole point of that is to unwittingly pull children underneath yes. the umbrella of Satan. Yeah. Um, so, so those are two places you can be. I don't think there's any other place. I think you've got those two places and you're either under one or you're under the other or you're halfway in between the two, which I don't recommend that position either. So going into some making a decision that you want the protection of God, but it has to be a decision. It's God's not gonna always yank you that direction. He really wants you to walk that way, to seek him out, to figure out what, you need to do to be protected and uh, boy i'll tell you there's no better way in my opinion of um uh, of having to figure out how to be protected uh than to start writing about the brotherhood <laughs> because <laughs> i got a quick education <laughs> a yes. very fast education and oh boy this is interesting <laughs> how do i get myself into this particular thing because i sure didn't expect that um but because, you know, Lucifer does not want this information out, he's yeah. going to do whatever he can to keep it from getting out. Of course, that won't work forever. It won't work long term. Um, but he does, you know, he does make life miserable if you, <laughs> unless you know, unless you really figure it out. And then you have to decide, do I want to live under the agony or do I not? Yeah. Because there's those two places to be, so. Um, it's good. And I, I like that illustration. And I would just add that um, part of the programming is to believe that these two kingdoms are equal 
in um, abilities and strengths. And so it's kind of like the superheroes, the Marvel comics, yeah. comics, you know, it's like you, you root for the good guy, but you know, it's this back and forth like this. And we have to know that ultimately God has, is more powerful and has a good plan. Uh, otherwise this is a really bad story. And right. Um, you know, it's like if God isn't all powerful and then, you know, we have to wrestle through free will and, and God's sovereignty and each person has to kind of come, you know, both biblically and personally to what they, uh, are about, but I have to believe that God has a really good plan of restoration that is going to make sense to all of us when we see the whole picture. It's just, we don't see the whole picture right now. We just see our little bit. And so I, I am believing some powerful glory is on the way. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, it would be easy to just go, ah, why fight this, you know? And so that's what gives me hope. I wrestle with that idea, you know, because it, it seems like, well, if God has all this power, which we know he do at a, on a mental level, we know he does. So if he has all this power, why are we going through all this? You know, I think kids coming out of the system, coming out of trauma, we all have that. Yeah. Thought process at some point or another. Why on earth, you know, if God's got all this power, what is all this about? I don't really get it. Why am I going through this? Why did I, what do you mean I had to go through it? What is this for? You know, kind of um, really wrestling and mulling over what the whole point of it is. Um, yeah. But there is a point and I don't think we know the bigger picture. I yeah. think that it's, it's a mystery. So even if you don't know, just keep putting one foot in front of the other. Yeah. Because there is a destination. Even if God doesn't need us to go through all of this, he doesn't need me to, you know, write mm -hmm. all these articles. He doesn't need you to remember whatever you haven't remembered from your past. I don't necessarily think this is a necessity, but there's part of this process that's important. Yes. It's important. It grows us in a way that I think will benefit us in in some capacity at some future time that we don't even understand. Yeah. And, and I'll admit, you know, every once in a while I come to a point where I go, I just, I can't do this anymore, God, you know, yeah. and he's always gracious to say, you don't have to, right. Um, but let me tell you what will be the fruit if you keep on this journey. Yeah. Um, and I, I hit that spot even recently and, you know, it was an, it was an interesting place of going, um, uh, it, it's hard to describe. It's like, uh, because I'm in ministry and it, it's a challenging place to be on my journey too. I would never wish this on anyone. And, you know, there's, and it was at that time when I was just like, I want to be nobody and nothing. I want to go hide. <laughs> you, know, yeah. I just don't wanna, yeah. um, you know, but this place of, you know, what if, stuff comes up that's so bad that I can't handle it and other people can't handle it. And then I'd be letting people down, you know, Yeah. and this other place of I could just plateau and pretend my way and stay right where I'm at. And either one of those to me are unacceptable, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's like, okay, God, I'm just trusting you to show me the way through. And, you know, the picture that he gives me um, regularly is he's just like, just put your hand in mine and take the next step. Yeah. yeah. One, and that's, one thing at a time. Yep. One, one small thing at a time. <laughs> yep. I, I have to say though, you know, in thinking about therapeutic relationships, that one of the best, <laughs> and it's kind of odd that this one, one of the best um, and most informative times for me was when I got yelled at by someone who is not supposed to be yelling at me. I mean, mm -hmm. that was not, that would not have been in the therapeutic manual of how to do things, right? Yes. So there are, and I don't think that the individual that did it uh, felt very good about it. And I sure didn't feel very yeah. good about it. But there was something about it that um, in the long run was not only necessary, but was incredibly helpful. Yes. And so sometimes, you know, it's not always good to go outside of, of the bounds of good practice. However, um, sometimes you could do something that you think will injure somebody, but in fact, not only does not injure them, but kind of kickstarts them into 
a different level of healing that they weren't maybe able to get to from where they were before. So yeah. I think that's, it's, you know, go ahead. That's really good. And I, I think that's part of understanding all things work together for good. Yeah. If we're willing to release that to the Lord. And um, I, similarly, I had some things happen recently that triggered, uh, the person didn't mean to trigger, but some things triggered, but it was good because I allowed the Lord to take me to a place where some new memories surfaced and was able to get a deeper level of healing. Mm-hmm. And so um, I, I like to, there's a, a mentality that we tend to have in the church is, um, and it feels like it, you know, I'm being attacked or is the bad things are happening and all yeah. of those. But I, I, I find so much more life when I go, I am safe in the hands of God. Yeah. And if he allows things to come, there's a reason. And if I'm willing to work it out with him, it's going to be for my benefit. Um, and it's what a friend of mine calls righteous suffering. And I, I don't like that. But no. I don't like it either. <laughs> I think I think about that every time. Well, like <laughs> I wrote a post recently. Lord help me. Um, and it was, uh, the, it created a lot of consternation. So, uh, and I, well, you know, I debated whether to publish it even because I, I knew at least one person I knew it would not please. Yeah. Um, and those decisions are hard. Yeah. You have to, to weigh a lot of different things. Do I, do I want someone to be, to think that I'm intentionally trying to harm them or intentionally trying to tear down their closely held beliefs? And the answer to that is of course, no. At the same time, you either have truth yeah. at, as your primary goal mm-hmm. or you don't. Yeah. And that I think is central in healing for a lot of people. Do you want the truth of what you've been through? Yeah. And sometimes the answer is no, because it's just so painful. <laughs> yeah. And, but I think when you back off from that pain and let, let Jesus handle it yeah, because he can, then you can say yes. And that's where the freedom comes. The freedom comes in truth. The freedom comes when you know it all and it doesn't have a hold over you anymore. Yeah. That is so true. And even recently in my journaling, it's so funny when I look back at it, I'm like, oh, this is so hilarious to look at because, you know, it is the Lord begins to reveal some truth. And I go, nope, don't want to go there. Don't want to go there. <laughs> and then, and I, then, you know, the other part of me goes, no, I do. I do yeah. want to know the truth. So it's, it's hard. It's not, it easy. is a struggle. It's a struggle. And, and it's completely. <laughs> completely easy to waffle back and forth between yeah i want to know no i don't yes i do no i don't oh dear <laughs> which millisecond am i gonna land on yeah yeah but then that's you know the truth the truth will set us free free yeah it's and so that's it's, what I the bible true. says christ is truth god is yeah. truth yeah and that's I think the way to get to one of the ways to get to God is to strip away everything that isn't truth. Yes. You strip it all away. You lay it bare. You stomp on the father of lies. <laughs> you get rid of the devil. You kick him to the curb. And then when you've got truth left over, that's when you've got a free and clear path to yes. sit, to sit with God a hundred percent of the time. And it's such a better place to be than anywhere you can imagine. And that's the hard part too. How do you convince somebody to go through all this agony to get rid of and strip off all this nonsense that they've layered upon you and layered and layered like bad paint job, right? You know, you've got a kitchen of a house that was built in the 1800s and you got to take off 900 layers of paint and it's not fun and it's smelly and it's hard work and it, it just is, is agonizing. But the reward at the end is so much better than you can yes. imagine. And that's what I tell my clients and groups, particularly new clients and new groups, is, you know, this could get a whole lot worse before it gets better. And oh, not good. Oh, not good. It will. <laughs> and even though I say that, still people get into it, you know, and it's like, well, I'm not getting better. And it's like, well, yeah, when we stop all of the 
covering over of everything and we bring it into the light, it is painful yep. and it can feel like it's worse for a season, but I I'm grateful that I'm pressing through and um, that's all I can say. Me too, important. because every single person, every single person that comes out of this horrendous tradition, first of all, stops it for the subsequent generations, yes. which is part of getting this brotherhood crap out of, out of the world, you know? Yeah. So when you come out, you stop it from happening to your kids and their kids, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And you also add to the, you add to the knowledge that then gives the whole puzzle, right? You've got your puzzle piece and your puzzle piece locks with someone else's or overlaps. And, um, and then having more than, you know, I think of the people that have been, been out and talking for three decades and they are to be cherished. Yes. However, there's so many more people with so many more stories. And those people who have been beating the path for 30 years are going to be ecstatic when you and the rest of the individuals are able to bring forth what you know too, because it will vindicate what they have been talking about. So good. What a conversation. We're going to wrap it up here, but this has been so good, Veronica. Thank you for uh, engaging with me on some things that are really difficult to talk about. Um, yeah. Well, thank you I, for having me here. I appreciate it. Boy, I didn't expect to be here for the third time when I <laughs> contacted you last December, but I love our conversation. Yes. So yes. thank you for, for having, having me on and for sharing your story with me. That's an honor to hear it. Thank you. And hopefully more conversations to come. So, and I just yes. want to bless those of you who are listening and just encourage you. It is worth the journey. And so again, just the simplicity of putting your hand in the hand of true Jesus and taking that next step. It is worth it. Yep. So we'll look forward to seeing you next time on Testimony Mountain.